We are currently at Mizhahidia first. It's located in Novi Petrivci in Kiev Oblast in Ukraine. And it has become a base for a festival which is in its uh, fourth year now. And it brings the best of investigative journalists around the world. But it's also known as the residence of former ousted Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych. And with us we have Oliver Bolo. He's a book author and a journalist. And he's here with us to talk about asset recovery and other things. Hello, Oliver. Hello, very nice to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, so it's been four years um, since former president Yanukovych um, has been ousted and he fled Ukraine for Russia. Um, other members of former government have also been removed from their position. Last time we spoke, you said, it was I think in 2014 or 2015, you said there has been no progress on recovering those frozen corrupt assets. Uh, can you talk me through what's happened since, if there has been any progress? Well, there has been progress in changing the law. Um, obviously, Ukraine has created NABU, the, the Anti-Corruption Bureau, which has been good. Um, Ukraine has, has uh, brought uh, drug procurement, went to international agencies instead of being run by the health ministry, which helped reduce prices and reduce corruption. That's very good. Uh, procurement has become much more transparent. This is, this is, these are all very good and very important things in terms of preventing corruption in future. I mean, it's still very fragile and it's very difficult to know how long, how, how well this will last, but it's, you know, this is, these are important steps and I think that Ukrainians can be very pleased with some of the progress that's been made. But specifically, you were asking about the recovery of stolen assets. And this is an, you know, an enormous, an enormous amount of money was stolen from Ukraine. We don't know exactly how much, but obviously billions of dollars. Um, and re progress on recovering that has been very, very slow. Um, but I, I think that partly after 2014 and, and the revolution, there was a expectations or hopes that this money would be seized in Switzerland, in Latvia, in the UK, and, and returned to Ukraine very quickly, where it could help you know, fund the army or build roads or fund hospitals and so on. I think a lot of those hopes were very unrealistic. I mean, if you look at the case of Pavlo Lazarenko, um, who was Prime Minister in the 1990s, he was arrested in California, um, jailed in America. He was out of jail. He was, he's out of jail. He's still in America. This all happened. I mean, he was arrested, what, uh, almost 20 years ago, 18, 19 years ago. And they still haven't managed to confiscate his money and return it to Ukraine. That happened two decades ago. So the process is incredibly difficult and incredibly complicated because um, partly because it involves many different countries. It's, these are court cases happening all over the world in many different countries simultaneously. And also because these people are very rich and rich people can hire the best lawyers and the best lawyers are very good at delaying things. So, I mean, it's, it's no, there has been no, essentially no progress in recovering assets outside Ukraine that belong to, you know, the, the, the insiders from the Yanukovych regime. Um, but it was probably unrealistic to imagine there would be progress. Um, it, this takes, if it happens at all, it takes decades. Right, and obviously it's not a secret to anyone that current Ukrainian president Petro Poroshenko is also a very wealthy man. And there have been things like Panama Papers and then later on Paradise Papers, which expose uh, the numerous companies, I think it's uh, over 100 companies around the world that he has, and some of them uh, have been involved in some suspicious operations. Of course, he's been denying this. Uh, Poroshenko has been saying that he needed that to be able to sell his confectionery business, Roshan. Uh, but many activists in Ukraine, however, are not convinced. They say his explanations are not like incomplete and contradictory. Do you think that the same sort of fate will await current Ukrainian government? I'd be um, I don't think anyone is comparable really in who's currently in power in Ukraine is comparable with Yanukovych. I mean, you know, Yanukovych was so corrupt and so awful that, that I, you know, I think you have to be really bad to provoke a revolution and he was really bad. You know, I think Poroshenko, to be honest, it isn't illegal to have companies um, in the British Virgin Islands or, or a law firm in Panama. You know, these things, lots of people have this. It's, you know, some of the people in the Pan Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers were just sort of actors and actresses and people who want a bit of privacy. So that isn't itself illegal. So, I mean, no, I don't think that I would be surprised if there were another revolution against Poroshenko or because it doesn't seem like he's that bad. He's just kind of a bit bad. Um, um, whereas the, I was surprised there was a revolution against Yanukovych. I mean, revolution's always surprising, right? So, I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll start tomorrow and I'll be like, wow, look at that. 
But I, I, I'm not expecting it. I don't think anyone's expecting it, are they? Right. Apart from Saakashvili, but then he's always expecting stuff. <laughs> okay. um, so moving on to Russia, on which you, of course, are an expert. Um, the United Kingdom has been known unofficially as the haven for Russian oligarchs and their... Officially sort of, as well, yeah, probably. <laughs> and their money, which yeah, is yeah. probably like not really earned in um, completely legal or transparent ways. Uh, recently, recently, it seems like the UK has been trying to change that and they have introduced some new things like the UWO, the Unexplained Wealth Orders and the Sanction and Anti-Money Laundering Bill, which has become a law just weeks ago. And I mean, it might be connected or not, but Roman Abramovich has also been, I mean, it's not completely um, short, like for sure yet, but he's either been denied or just not given the visa, um, which might be connected to this whole sort of crackdown on Russian oligarchs. Um, can you tell us whether it's actually, whether these things are actually changing, whether it's going to become tougher for Russian oligarchs in London and just, UK in general? So it, it's not just Russian oligarchs. Um, we're, we're very open to any oligarchs. Um, so we don't, you know, the, I mean, we like Russian oligarchs, obviously, but, but, but also Nigerians, Chinese, Malaysian, um, I mean, any, any, from anywhere, Kazakhstan, Ukraine. I mean, it's, it isn't a Russian thing. I mean, we, we just happen to like money in general. So, um, but there has definitely been a shift in, in the, in, certainly in rhetoric in the UK in the last five years. Um, in, in we recognize, I think, more than we used to, the damage that this money is doing, the theft of this money from, it, from its original countries is doing. And we also recognize the damage it's doing in our own country in terms of making everything more expensive and driving inequality and so on. So, you know, yes, there has been a change. There has been you know, um, some things are much more transparent than they used to be. And as you say, unexplained wealth orders, which will allow um, police to, to confiscate property without having a, conv a, a criminal conviction um, in, in a new way, uh, that would, uh, that may change things. But, but this is very early days. I haven't actually, none of them have been tested in court yet, really. Uh, so we don't know if it'll actually lead to anything. Um, you know, hope dies last. Uh, um, but experience perhaps maybe would suggest that we need to be a bit cautious. Um, normally, nothing ever changes. Uh, in Britain, we, Britain is a centre for laundering dirty money. We're good at it. Um, and normally, our bankers just find a new way of doing it. Right. And I mean, some good news from Ukraine as well. Like, you probably know that we have just adopted a law on the anti-corruption court. Yes. Uh, which has been much anticipated by Ukraine's activists and also by Ukraine's international uh, partners around the world. However, questions still, however, questions still remain how much in compliance there is with international standards. Would you say it's happy days for Ukraine now, or is it still a long sort of battle to fight? Well, I, I sort of think the way you need to look at it is to say, well, you know, we're not, you know, Ukraine isn't Sweden yet. Um, you know, that would be nice if it were suddenly to become Sweden, but I don't, I think that's not likely to happen. So you need to think of it as every little win is a win. So the anti-corruption court, yeah, it's not perfect but it's still better than not having an anti-corruption court at all. So yeah, it's something to build on. So yeah, I mean, you might be, you know, at sort of 25% Sweden, right? But, but that's better than being 5% Sweden. So I don't know, I think it's good. I think all of these little gains that's, that Ukraine has been making about outsourcing medical procurement to the UN and the Crown agents to, to bringing in the Prozoro procurement system, um, all these things are good and you know opening up the company registration data you know it, it's it, it, it's all every single one of these is a victory and and i think we you know you, ukraine should be very pleased with with that but it but it's still only 25 percent you know you're it's a long long way to go i mean and some some of these people need to go to jail um you know none of these people have gone to jail it's it's none of this money has been confiscate, confiscated i mean the the, the help that Ukrainian prosecutors have been able to show, you know, their colleagues in Latvia and colleagues in, in the United States, colleagues in the UK, you know, has been really inadequate. And the Ukrainian prosecutors need to be much, much better at their job if they're going to have any hope of taking, putting these people in prison and taking their money away, because that's the only thing that actually, at the end, will change anything. Do we know much about the, the law itself? Um, like because I know there have been discussions whether it's satisfying all these demands that have been put forward by the international partners. Is there, how much is known about this? I think um, we need to wait to see what the International Monetary Fund say. Um, right. They tend to be the ones, I mean, they, they, they can be a bit flexible, but we'll have to wait and see what they say. If they think it's enough, then, then that will be interesting. Um, you know, I mean, I know that it, 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 it certainly could be a lot worse. So maybe that's the attitude they'll take.
and uh, so hopefully hopefully they'll think it's okay because you know, you, you know Ukraine still needs that money from the IMF. Okay, and I believe it's been like less than 24 hours still that this news broke out on new charges against Donald Trump's former aide Paul Manafort and for the first time about his associate Konstantin Klebnik. I think we haven't had anything about I haven't heard anything about it since February and uh, Klimnik was of course born in Ukraine but he reportedly has ties with Russian intelligence so do you think these new charges are likely to help the case uh, move along and how willing is Ukraine to help investigate this case because there have been several stories in different foreign publications like saying that Poroshenko has been given javelins in um, exchange for sort of stopping this case and not investigating further it, I, I've, it can be very difficult to tell um, in the experience of certainly of people I've spoken to about whether Ukrainian prosecutors are actually trying to help or not um, because the help that they provide can be so substandard anyway that um, it's difficult to tell whether they're being obstructive or helpful. Um, so I, it, this case with the, you know, with the missiles and stopping the investigation, I, I certainly have no reason to believe that that isn't true. But then. I'm not sure how much help Ukraine would have been able to provide anyway, because um, they don't tend to be very good at helping people So, the, in the prosecutor's office. Um, I mean, this is interesting, the Manafort things, but, but I mean, I, it looks to me that, you know, um, it's just a little bit of a, of a much bigger picture and, and maybe we shouldn't think too much about Manafort, because actually the big stuff is, is, is obviously Trump and his family and, and what they're getting up to, and Manafort's a little bit of a, bit of a sideshow. What about this guy, Konstantin Klemnik? Because I'm not sure how much we know about him. And for the first time, we have we hear about these charges against him. And he was born in Ukraine, but he has t uh, he has ties with Russia, with Russian intelligence. Well, and as I understand it, he's in Russia. Um, and so that's that. I mean, you know, as soon as someone's in Russia, that's that. So, I mean, it, I mean, the, the indictment is interesting, but, but none, of these none of these charges will be tried in, in a court because Russia obviously isn't going to surrender him, whoever he is. So, so he may or may not, I mean, I, presumably he does have ties to Russian intelligence because, you know, Robert Mueller says he does, but we don't actually know that and we never will um, because that's the way Russia works. It's, it's, um, it is, it, it, it's a bit of an unsatisfactory approach that, that, that the way that he was allowed out and allowed to go to Russia and escape because that's a shame. It would be good if he were, you know, being a big actual tried in court. And I also need to ask you about the human rights situation because obviously it's been bothering all of the Ukrainians and it's sort of sending shockwaves abroad as well because of, I mean, the recent thing, um, Russia, of course, has a track record of um, violating human rights. And this is a, a case in annexed Crimea as well. So just recently we heard about Roman Sushenko. He's a Ukrainian journalist who has been, uh, who is from Crimea actually, but he was kind of, known for his pro-Ukrainian position and he's been sentenced to 12 years um, in prison um, and obviously there are people like Oleg Sensov and Volodymyr Baluch who are on a hunger strike in also in Russian prisons and they demand the end to political prisoning in Russia. Um, at the same time Russia is just days away from hosting the World Cup and there are things like US President Donald Trump has just spoken in favor of um, Russia's return to the G7. So do you think the West is actually doing enough to sort of put an end to this human rights abuse or can they be done? Can they do more? Well, they could do more, certainly. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't think any more is likely. I mean, look at Trump is, is uninterested now in helping. I mean, I'm not sure he even thinks of the West as a thing. I think he's, he just thinks of America and everyone else. Um, Italy obviously is apparently keen to make friends with Russia again. Um, so, so it's going to be more about a case of trying to maintain what we already have in terms of sanctions and, and so on, rather than trying to build, do anything else. I don't think anything else is, is likely. I'm, you know, leaving aside the fact that, you know, obviously Britain is distracted by because of Brexit and, and, and all that. And, and so it's difficult to imagine anyone being able to take the lead without, you know, a sort of a strong British voice, a strong American voice. And with other European countries like Italy, you know, Hungary and so on, stopping anything from happening. I can't see any progress as likely, no, sadly. I mean, which is awful because obviously the Sinsov case and so on are just terrible. But I don't, I can't see any response coming, no.